Hello my dear friends, you are on the military summary channel and today we will discuss the situation in Ukraine on the 7th of November. Today we have a lot of very interesting updates, so let's start. And first we are going to start with the north, with the Kharkiv LPR region, with the Kupinsk uh, Liman front line. Uh, the Ukrainians made a few attempts of penetrating the Russians' defense orders in this area. They were trying at the same areas, and if we are talking about the global scope, the Ukrainians were trying to attack in direction of Svatova from the north. As you can see, there were like an icons in this area. And if we're talking about the south, the Ukrainians were trying to attack in the direction of uh, Chervana Popovka in this area. All those attacks were repulsed by the Russians. And as a result of those attacks, the Ukrainians lost around 350 soldiers and something around 22 armored vehicles. I'm talking about the entire losses among all, entire, all over the front line. Furthermore, the Ukrainians activated on this forest that located on the north from Serebryanka. From this area, uh, the Ukrainians uh, are trying to attack the Russians near Dubrova, this small town, uh, because uh, they understand that this is the um, main problem area for the Ukrainians, because while they are trying to develop their offensive operation in the direction of Plashanka or Chervonopopovka, uh, a lot of forces, they are using a lot of reserve and forces from Tarskoy, Yap um, Yampolovka, Terny, from this area moving to the north. And uh, meanwhile, uh, the Russians are attacking them in their flank from the direction of Dubrova Kriminaya. So this is the reason why the Ukrainians uh, change, a little bit changed their tactic and now their main goal why the forces in the north are developing their offensive operation in the direction of Plashanka and Chervonopopovka on this bridgehead. The Ukrainians tries to attack from the south to pin down the Russians in Dubrova. And we'll see I believe in a few days about the results of this new tactic but for now uh, we see that, Ukraine, that all the Ukrainian attacks were repulsed by the Russians and there were no progress on the front line. Furthermore, if we're talking about the Russians, uh, almost every single day we receive more and more updates about these front lines uh, where uh, we see that the Ukrainians had a lot of losses, they have a lot of losses every day and they're not very motivated to continue this offensive operation. And to tell the truth, sometimes uh, it seems to me that the Ukrainians are just trying to pin down the Russians and not to allow them to start counter-offensive operation before the upcoming winter, because uh, for now these attacks didn't give any progress for the Ukrainians. Now let's move to the south, to the area from Seversk to Bakhmut. From this area we got a lot of updates from the, from the Russian sources. And one of the most interesting and important is that today different Russian sources reported about the fact that the Russians managed to enter the town by the name of Bilogorovka. And if we take a look at this map, we're going to see that there are two Bilogorovka in this area. The first one is located on the north, this one. And uh, during the previous days, the Russians made few attempts to attack this area, trying to pin down the Ukrainians and to reduce their bridgehead in this area. And also, we understand that because of the fact that the, the Ukrainians start using this forest on the north of Serebryanka to attack the Russians in Dubrova, uh, the Russians understand that they need to attack Bilogorka and return control over Grigoryevka just on purpose to reduce the Ukrainian possibilities in this forest. So, this is possible Bilogorovka that might be taken by the Russians. But another source are saying that the Russians were talking about this Bilogorovka that located on the south from Beristovoya on the east from ya um, Yam Yakovlevka about this Bilogorovka. To tell the truth, for now we don't have a certain uh, confirmation about uh, which Bilogorovka was taken or where exactly the Russians entered. If you ask me, I believe that the Russians entered this Bilogorovka according to this map, but some of the Russian military experts are saying that the Russians entered North Bilogorovka. Why I'm saying about this, why do I, do I think that the Russians entered this one? Because according to the report we received, uh, the LPR 11th campaign and uh, Wagner forces uh, entered the Bilogorovka according to the report. And as we know, as we know, uh, Wagner's are working exactly in this area, near this Belogorovka. And if we're talking about this Belogorovka, this area, I believe, is under defense, or, or is in, in the zone of responsibility of the Russian army that located in Kriminaya, Privilia. So it's not a little bit the zone of responsibility of Wagner's, if we're talking about Belogorovka. Yes, we know that the during, during, the, during, during the previous weeks, the uh, Wagner's were forced to move to the north, and I believe that Wagner's 
some sources, some Russian sources were saying that Wagner's were moved in direction of Sporne because the Ukrainians managed to penetrate the Russian defense orders in this area, and the only force that uh, had possibility that managed to stop the Ukrainians was. Uh, exactly uh, Wagner forces so they were here near Sporne but I'm not sure that the Wagners were moved so far to the north not to their zone of responsibility so for now let's take uh, let's wait a little bit and I believe that soon we're going to understand which Belogorovka was taken if uh, the Russians took control over this Belogorovka that means that the Ukrainians possibilities of sending their commanders and scouts to these to the north to these forests was reduced because now they need to do something now I believe that the Russians uh, started their fightings in Grigoryevka and now the Ukrainians uh, are forced to concentrate on Grigoryevka not to allow the Russians to penetrate these orders and not to allow the Russians to attack Serebryanka in their flanks so uh, and of course this town has a very big value in this operation in in uh, let's say Svatova defense operation this town has a very important value but if we're talking about this Belogorovka, this, this Belogorovka has a uh, very big value as well, because uh, the Russians are fighting for Yakovlevka, I believe, since May of this year, or maybe June. And this, the only town uh, that uh, separates the Russians between uh, their victory uh, uh, over this territory, over the entire Solidar town. So the Russians are not able to develop their offensive operation a deeper in direction of Solidar because of Yakovlevka. But to take Yakovlevka first, the Russians need to storm and to clear Bilogorovka. And if the Russians manage to storm and take control of Bilogorovka, that means that now they are able to attack Yakovlevka from the flank. So let's update. This is the reason. And of course, if we're talking about Wagner's, it for them, there it's like uh, correlate with their main direction in attacking of Bakhmut because for now the Russians are storming Bakhmut from many sides but we can't say that this operation um, uh, is prepared completely because we don't see any offensive operation from the north and I believe to be successful um, in attack of Bakhmut the Russians need to establish control over the north part of this area and to attack Bakhmut from the north as well so according to my understanding of this situation the Russians got control of Belogorovka or at least these hours they are doing some kind of clearing operation of this area but I believe that they will be if the Russians report it I believe that in a day or maybe by the middle of this week we are going to receive the first confirmation that the Russians got control over this town I'm not sure that uh, there is a town, It's me. I believe that it's more a ruins, but anyway, I believe that there are positions where the Russians can establish their, fight, their um, shooting positions and so on. And from this area, now the Russians are able to develop their offensive operation direction of Visola. And of course, uh, to attack Yakom, uh, Yakovlevka from the flanks, and furthermore, the Russians are able to attack Yakovlevka at least from three sides or something like this. And if the Russians are able to take these towns, and I believe that they will have to spend another week or maybe two to do this, then we can say that we can start counting days before Solidar is going to fall without these positions. Because uh, from this bridgehead, if the Russians are able to establish this bridgehead, they have. A lot of positions to attack. They will be able to attack uh, Razdolovka. They will be able to attack Solidar from the north and to pin down the Ukrainians in this in this area. Um, there are a lot of uh, big buildings, high buildings in this area, and to pin down the Ukrainians there will allow the Russians to develop their offensive operation direction of Bakhmutska. So you know, I believe that the next weeks we are going to see. Uh, we will totally concentrate in this area. Furthermore, if the Russians are able to take Visola, then we the Ukrainians will have problems in their bridgehead in Vyimka, Ivana Darivka, and this bridgehead might be might be collapsed by the Russians. So Bilogorovka is very important, and as we can see, the Russians, I believe, are moving in this direction. If we're talking about Bakhmut, we got uh, during the previous uh, evening we got a lot of updates from this area and by the way the russian source move has been updated uh, just now and uh, uh, the russians reported that they managed to penetrate the ukrainian defense orders near ivan grad near uh, on the south part of bakhmut and uh, 
uh, they're developing their offensive operation. We got a lot of updates from the Ukrainian side that they are very have have a very bad situation in Bakhmut, in this town. They have a lot of losses and they are forced to step back and to retreat. And now there are very heavy clashes around town by the name of Opotnites, some kind of suburbs of Bakhmut. And as you can see. I believe we discussed the situation yesterday. Uh, the Russians decided not to attack Oputna like in front uh, because it's like a waste waste of time and human power. But the Russians uh, on the in the bridgehead of Ivangrad they decided to move a little bit to the north and then to attack a little bit to the west, uh, trying to um, cut off Oputna from uh, the mainland. And as you can see, according to the updates, now we have clashes exactly in this area uh, in this uh, on these streets uh, the Russians are attacking near dam uh, attacking near dam storming near dam and trying to cut the Ukrainians who located on Oputna from the north and with help of this operation they're trying to encircle this area I'm not saying that is this in a very an easy job but anyway um, I believe that the Russians are able to do this because uh, the Ukrainians had a lot of losses in the south of Bakhmut during the previous weeks. Furthermore, we know that the Ukrainians have their lot of reinforcement exactly in this area, on the line of Kurdyumovka, Zaryanovka, Klishevka, in this area, a lot of mechanized brigade, and it's very, it's not an easy job to move reinforcements to Opetna because all the roads is under Russian fire control. So I believe that maybe the next week or this week the Russians will be able to establish control over the south part of Bakhmut and after that we are going to see a completely different picture in operation of storming Bakhmut. Because from this area the Russians will be able to continue moving on the uh, suburbs on outskirts of Bakhmut trying to cut the main road that supplied uh, Bakhmut is the road that connects Chasov Yar and Bakhmut. So the Russians anyway they need in circle. Maybe and all these attacks like in Yampolovka, Bilovgorovka is completely correlate with attacking Oputna because it's some kind of encirclement operation of Bakhmut. There are a lot of Ukrainian forces there, but we understand the ratio. Uh, this ratio doesn't make sense, of course, because the Russians are attacking, but they had less losses than the Ukrainians who is defending. Uh, today we got some report from uh, from Uglidar, and we will discuss this a little bit later. But the Russians are saying that the ratio is seven to one, nine to one in Russian favor. So the Ukrainians kills one Russian, and the Russians during the storm operation are able to kill around seven or nine Ukrainian soldiers. It's nonsense, uh, but uh, I believe that it might be true for many reasons and we need to understand that if we're talking about let's say Glidaro other front lines we are talking about the Russian regular army um, sometimes not so much motivated and if we're talking about Bakhmut we are talking about the private company Wagner and believe me soldiers they are very motivated and you need to understand that most of the soldiers who serves in the Wagner forces a lot of a lot of soldiers uh, who involved in the storm operation who is a part of these storm groups is the ex-prisoners so believe me they have a very big motivation because as we discussed six months contracts and they are completely free and they are able to return back as the heroes but not as the mercenaries as a, as the bad guys so they are very motivated to live they are very motivated to survive and they're mo very motivated to to reduce as much Ukrainians as possible. So this situation about Bakhmut, so Bakhmut are losing, the Ukrainian forces in Bakhmut are losing their positions, and they're slowly, but they're collapsing. So let's see what's going to be next. Now we're moving to Donetsk, and there are a lot of updates as well. Uh, mainly we see that there are a lot of updates on the map. The Russian sources map has been updated, as you can see. The green line moves a little bit. Now it shows the real situation in Vadyane. At least, uh, at least the Russian source map confirms that. Now the Russians completely, 400% controls this, this part of Vadyane, these small villages, the small residential area. And they're very close to Opetne we can say that the west part of Vadyane, this area is in the gray zone i believe maybe that the russians also control this area but for now we haven't received any report about that furthermore we dis as we discussed with this ago that the russians decided to 
attack between these two towns between Pyromysk and Vadiana in this area and the Russian source map has been updated now they're showing that this cross of forest is also in the Russian control that used to be a very fortified Ukrainian position this area now these fortifications belongs to the Russians and now using this forest the Russians are able to move to the north to this green to this forest small forest and from this area they are able to attack and pin down the Ukrainians in this part of Vadiana and I believe this is exactly what they're doing right now furthermore we got update from uh, from uh, Spartak it's the small town in Donetsk on the north that the Russians are moving in direction of Oputna from the east and they also got a lot of um, like uh, there were a lot of updates that they got control over few trenches and fortification in this area so it was, I'm not sure about uh, the real picture in this area and how many of these trenches are under Ukrainian control or under Russian control but anyway I believe that this green gray line shows the real picture that the Russians are very close to Oputna and maybe that this uh, fortification is the only fortification that is the barrier between the Russians and Oputna from the east but anyway I believe that even this year we are going to see the battle for Oputna and maybe this year the Oputna is going to fall because it's highly unlikely that the Ukrainians have a lot of opportunities uh, to support this area. The Russians haven't provided any information about the losses from the Ukrainian side from this area um, to tell the truth uh, there i believe that there are a lot of losses and from both sides uh, mainly from the ukrainians but no updates now let's move to Ulgidar, one of the most important area these days and today we discussed about the situation in pavlovka in this area that the russians 155th marine uh, um, brigade refused to continue attack that they mass mm, uh, wrote some kind of message to the general staff and so on saying that because of stupid attack they lost a lot of soldiers and they were asking where required uh, the, um, the minister of defense and uh, military authorities to start some kind of investigation about the fact and so on today we got more updates about the situation uh today the minister of defense of russian federation gave some numbers from this area and they reported that uh, that that information about the situation in pavlovka was some kind of speculation um, some kind of speculation the Russians reported that as a result of heavy clashes in this area the Russians lost around one percent of killed like one percent uh, of forces who were involved in the attack uh, in direction of Pavlovka lost around one percent killed and something around seven percent were wounded if we're talking about the latter that uh, the uh, 155th uh, marine brigade wrote to the commanders uh, they wrote that they lost during one day around 300 soldiers and uh, if we try to calculate the numbers from the Ministry of Defense we got almost the same number because uh, brigade Russian brigade is around 3300 soldiers or something like this if we calculate one percent from that number we receive that around 33 people were killed during the defense operation direction of Pavlov Koglidar and so on and around seven percent were wounded so it's something around 206 230 soldiers so as you can see the numbers are almost the same the only difference is that the according to the latter that those soldiers wrote to the commanders they lost such a number um, during the day but the russians minister of defense reported that the losses uh, these losses were uh, around for 10 days of heavy clashes in this area and to tell the truth today um, I tried to investigate my own this situation and uh, to tell the truth I've got my totally my different opinion about this the situation and I will share with you my opinion and you need to understand that the things that we discussed yesterday and the thing that we find out today is not some kind of a true it's um it's a games it's a political games and uh, it's it's my opinion it's up to you to believe or not but i'll give you my opinion about the situation you need to understand that um, if we're talking about russian military power the russian military forces there are at least three powers in these forces the first one is the minister of defense the general staff uh, gerasimov shoigu and the head of the special um, operation uh, who is in the hat in charge of this special military operation is uh, Suvorikov. These three guys are uh, is are coming from the official Russian uh, power. So the Minister of Defense, the chief of head, um, uh, the uh, chief of general staff, and the head of this special operation, Shoigu, Gerasimov, and Suvorikov. These three guys is like comes from the official Russian power. 
this video we discussed about the Wagners. This is the second power, and all these powers are responsible in front of Putin, the president of Russian Federation, of course. They are able to report directly to him. So the Wagners and Prigozhin, the head of Wagners, it's like a small army in this special operation. He has he has a very big army, and as you can see, his army these days does the, the main job. They're storming Bakhmut. They're storming Bakhmut, and they're pretty successful. They're storming this fortress very slowly, very accurate, they're trying to reduce their losses, trying to deal as much as possible damage to the Ukrainians. So we can say that this is a very powerful power. In Russian military let's say sphere so this is the second power and there is third power in Russian military sphere and I'm, t I'm talking about um, uh, the head of Chechnya Kadyrov yes uh, this is small republic is a part of Russian Federation Chechnya Kadyrov and we you heard a lot about Kadyrov forces and Ahmad the special forces Ahmad you saw a lot of video where these forces were forcing the Ukrainian um, soldiers to say Ahmad is power and something like this and those guys were involved in storming uh, of Severodonetsk Lysychansk agglomeration uh, that they, they were involved there force furthermore the uh, um, Ahmad forces were involved in its storming of Mariupol and so on. So this is a very powerful uh, third power in Russian military sphere and all these guys uh, they're, they are able to report directly to Putin and to uh, of course I believe that they coordinate their uh, movements on the on the ground but they are responsible in front of Putin but believe me of course it's a very big power. It's not like a small shop on the street, it's a military sphere, it's a lot of soldiers, a lot of weapons, a lot of money, and a lot of money. So that's why they have a lot of, of, of course, they're competing between each other. And um, I got answer, at least for me, about this separation near Pavlovka as soon as, as soon as I heard the first and the second name of the generals who were responsible for that operation. Uh, According to the national, let's say, uh, you know that every single nation has their own names, second, first name, and I believe that if we're talking about Russia, uh, they have their own, like Ivan, their like name. If we're uh, talking about Ukraine, like the most popular name is Mikola or something like this. You know that we can, we can sometimes we can recognize the nationality according to their second, the first name, and. If I understand correct, if I understood correct, the generals who were responsible for attack in Pavlovka uh, at least belong to um, to those nationality who are very connected with Chechnya, with Kadyrov forces. It's my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that the forces who were responsible for attack for Pavlovka was under responsibility in front of Kadyrov. It's like the forces that we just, one of the forces we discussed right now. I believe that those guys was just set up. The, the losses in Pavlovka are not so huge as we discussed right now. Uh, according to the report of Ministry of Defense and according to that letter, 300 losses is not killed. It's killed, wounded and missed and something like this. It's not a big deal. It's a war, it's a storm operation of not very nice positions where the Ukrainians are able from Ugladar to attack back, but those guys were set up and uh, the thing is that according to the rumors that we have on the internet, those generals were promised that they will receive at least three heroes of, for Rus of Russian Federation, three medals of heroes of Russian Federation. I believe it was some kind of political trap those guys started that offensive operation i'm not sure i don't know about if they're planned or not but as a result we see what we see we see that at least one power um, that was damaged by another powers in russian military authorities and i believe that kadyrov was attacked by uh, th two different powers like maybe wagner or maybe minister of defense or maybe any other type of power so it's not a fail of the russians in pavlovka it was just a political games and some kind of some forces in Russian political games were trying to reduce the mighty and power of another political power in the Russian Federation. It's my opinion. Uh, you can share with me. It's very interesting to discuss this situation. But 
it wasn't like uh, as we saw in internet that it was like a big fail or something like this it wasn't like that it was just a political game today the russians haven't provided any numbers about the losses or something like this the only thing they provided the russians still have control on the south of pavlovka and the russians uh, still uh, have control in the south of Novomikhailovka in this area they're continuous storming uh, very slowly um, the weather are, is not very good in this area and today i uh, take took a look at the weather map and uh, we need i believe that we need to expect of some kind of activation only after 16th of November because um, on 16th of November at night and during the day the temperature in this region and the south of Ukraine is around 1 um, degree by Celsius so it's enough to make the land a little bit better for the armored vehicles and vehicles to move to use it so only after 16th of November uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians will be able to continue uh, using the fields and the roads to attack to do some actions but before that there are a lot of rain it's like a rainy weather and temperature is around 7 10 degrees by celsius and it's not very good weather uh, to use the fields to attack and so on so before that i believe that we are not going to see any actions on the front line if we're talking about Kherson district the same story is the ukrainians were attacking the direction Duchan, this town in direction of Bilagorka, uh, this one they were trying to uh, develop their bridgehead on the south of Davidov Broad and Novokamenka, uh, this Novokamyanka and the Ukraine lost around 110 soldiers and something around 24 armored vehicles. As you can see there are also photos of this that there's some kind of um, helicopters were shot down, uh, the Russians are preparing fortifications around Energodar, we remember that uh, if we're talking about the last the uh, uh, help of, from the United States of America, they're planning to provide around 40 armored boats. So the Russians understand that the Ukrainians still continue using this river and they'll still try to use some kind of storm marine operation this year. So that's why they need to prepare fortification and not to allow the Ukrainians to take control over Energodar and over the uh, Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Um, there were also very interesting updates from the Russian side that they started some movement in the Zaporozhye area in the direction of Sherbaki. There are few towns in this area in the south, like Stipova, Mali, Sherbaki, Sherbaki. So the Russians were trying to cut this road that's supplied and connects this front line with Arekhov uh, fortification. And with help of that, maybe they were trying to develop some small bridgehead to the north, trying to split these two area, this area in two parts. So very interesting updates will follow because uh, the Russians, uh, all the time they do such a kind of small attack uh, in the previous times, in the previous periods, we know that a few days later the Ukrainians started a very big massive counter-offensive operation and they sometimes, and some of those offensive operations ended not so good for the Russians. Also today I believe you saw and you heard a lot of things and rumors about the negotiation process in, in Ukraine. You know that Sullivan visited Kiev and some sources, some rumors are saying that Sullivan were um, provided or requested Kiev to start um, uh, talk about negotiation process that they are ready to start negotiations and we discussed that Zelensky refused everything and according to the Russian sources Sullivan, Sullivan provided the following option for upcoming negotiation process. The Russians are moving from this bank of the river in Kherson, they are leaving Kherson to the Ukrainians and uh, the Ukrainians are getting control over this town. Uh, furthermore, the Russians started uh, the work of Zaporozhye nuclear power plant and started supporting Ukraine with electricity from this power plant without any problem. Furthermore, this front line, uh, the entire front line, are freezed without any movements and uh, this that's it. The Russians won't return control over the rest part of Donetsk People Republic or something like this. Um, also, the United States of America provides around 50 billions of dollars, 50 billions of dollars to the Ukraine, and a small, some part of the Russian money that are freezed, that were freezed, and the uh, Western banks you know, for uh, recovering or restoring the Ukraine. And uh, but according to information I have, Zelensky refused. Uh, the, he, we don't have any understanding why did he refused this uh, 
these options for negotiation. But my understanding of this situation that the main things that the guys are dis, uh, have discussion over is the Paroji power plant. This one. Uh, uh, another option from Sullivan is that as soon as the, if Zelensky signed these agreements, the United States of America will provide him the modern air defense system. So it's like some kind of guarantee that the Ukrainians will be able to stop any upcoming or any further conflict with Russia in the future. But I believe that the main thing why Zelensky refused to uh, refuse these negotiations. Uh, first of all, he doesn't believe the West countries because it's not very stable. Republicans, Democrat parties, they are changed every month, every two or four years. And every single time you need to start everything from the beginning. It's not a stable system for Zelensky. He wants, he wants to have a stable uh, guarantee for ages, but not for like four years. And next president comes and the Russians started another war and nobody supports Ukraine. So for this reason, I believe that Zelensky wants to return control over the Zaporozhye power plant. Why is that? Because if he um, if he's able, if the Russians return, of course... Uh, the Ukrainians will be able to move some garrison in this area. Not so not so big, they don't need to have a very big garrison. But the thing that the Ukrainians will be able to do is to create this power plant as a dirty nuclear bomb. And this is the only option, this is the only guarantee that Ukrainians are able to have uh, to stop and to avoid any upcoming or further conflict with the Russians. Because if the Ukrainians are able to take control over this power plant, to, they of course they will produce energy, electricity for the Ukraine, they will be happy, but believe me, they will create and they will do everything necessary to make this power plant as the dirty nuclear bomb. And if the Russians, let's say in 2030s or in five and 10 years will start another war with Ukraine, the Ukrainians will be able to blow up this power plant and to stop any Russian progress in Ukraine. And this is what he wants. But of course, everybody understand that the Russians are not going to, uh, to give this power plant because they understand or they're planning to start more conflicts in the future or they understand that maybe the Ukrainians will start conflict in the future because we know that in 2024 there is elections in the, in the Russian Federation of course situation is not so good uh, so not nobody knows what is going to be next uh, at least uh, we can just project or something like this and don't forget that there is like a lot of rumors about negotiation about so on, but the Russians no matter the negotiations, no matter the Sullivan says, no matter that tomorrow the Republicans are going to win all kinds of elections we are able to imagine, no matter all these things, the Russians continue collecting forces. A lot of forces. They continue, first of all, the most important thing, that they managed to stabilize the front line using just 80,000 soldiers of the mobilized reserves. And 220,000 are still in the training centers. So a lot of forces, almost the same number as we see in this, uh, on these front lines, are still in the training centers. And the Russians are able to deploy them everywhere they want. And believe me, with this, such a big army, they are able to penetrate any type of Ukrainian defense, at least a small part of front line. The Russians with 220 soldiers are able to take Chernigov, Sumy, the north of Ukraine. They are able to, I believe, to take some... Uh, territories on the west part of Ukraine, or they are able uh, to attack from the from Zaporozhye in direction of Zaporozhye or Dnipro. They are able to do a lot, and they still have the reserves to deploy and to attack. And they continue collecting. They continue modernize their weapon. They continue doing some negotiations, some some contracts with Iran for drones and so on. They start. They increase the number of their own drones on the front line with Arlan, with Kub, with their own drones that they're attacking. And we had a lot of video confirmation that the, the Russians increased the intensity of using them. So if we're talking from this perspective, the situation in Ukraine are very difficult, very difficult. You know that uh, the energy facility of Ukraine was reduced for 30-40%. That's a lot. And 
every single town uh, is cut off from uh, from electricity for many hours during the day and today we see at some places that there is a fire on the energy facilities without even attack because the Ukrainian energy facility are no longer able to survive during this pressure on the energy facility system from the civilians from the residentials it's like simple thing we need to charge phones we need to uh, like um, uh, open or start our laptops, the TV and so on, and energy system cannot survive during this pressure in Ukraine without even Russian attack. And if the Russian continues attacking, it will make a collapse. We had a lot of rumors and talks that the Russians, Ukrainians are preparing the plan for e evacuation of 3 million people from Kiev. We know that the next year is, according to the understanding of the situation, there should be election of president in Ukraine. And Ukraine, the, they don't know what to do. The Ukrainians don't know what to do. And the thing is that Zelensky doesn't know what to do. The thing is that he understands perfectly. If he stops the war today, tomorrow he will be killed by his own citizens. It's my understanding of the situation. Uh, maybe you have another option. But if he stops the war on this line like this one as we see right now the question is why didn't you do this a year ago when you just can recognize crimea recognize dpr and lpr in these borders not like in these borders why did we lost so many people uh, why did we lost our industry everything we have for what just to mo move borders to get a lot of loans from the Western countries that the Ukrainians are not able to pay for. And their kids won't be able to pay for these loans. And maybe the kids of their kids won't be able to pay for these loans. What for? And he understands this very well. And he, as every single people, want to live, want to live with their families, with their kids, with his wife and so on. And he doesn't know what to do. And the, the only option for him is to win and to destroy Russia. This is the only case if he, because just if he wants to survive in physical way, if he wants to survive and not to be killed by, let's say, the Ukrainian nationalists or something like this. The situation is very difficult. The situation is very difficult and uh, I don't know what is he going to do. I don't know. Maybe, maybe elections, uh, the president, the elections of the president is the only thing for him that can save his life just to lose and then to go away okay guys i lost no i'm not responsible for this now the another president can stop this i did everything i could now please another president it's your it's up to you uh to agree or not with this situation the situation is very difficult and that's it for today military summary channel reminds me condemn any violence in ukraine thank you for your watching subscribe to my channel put your like share my patreon and have a good day bye bye